uh, our honored individual this year, we're, we're uh, going to be recognizing two people with our highest honor, which is the Senyak Award, which uh, I talked about earlier and we'll be talking more about tomorrow. And uh, so our next speaker is the recipient of that award for this year. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Don Scott's work, of course, I encourage you to read his book. I hope we have copies in the back. I'm not sure. But uh, it, for me, that was the book that really uh, turned me on to the electric universe idea. I learned an awful lot about uh, how magnetic fields actually work. <laughs> and uh, and I, I'm very inspired myself, and I think a lot of people are, about his, his whole idea of the, uh, the model of the sun. Um, again, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Electric Universe, the, this model was developed to some degree, oh, perhaps 40 years ago, by a man named Ralph Jurgens. And uh, Don Scott, in my opinion, has done the most to refine that model and explain it as, a, as an electronic, I guess, really is the right word, uh, mechanism that, that uh, has a control factor in the same way that a transistor has. And I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but uh, that is really a very profound idea and one that, uh, that there are attempts right now to, uh, to model that experimentally. And as Paul noted, it is, uh, it is scalable. And so, uh, and Monty Childs will be talking about that more. I'm sorry for going on and on, but I'm very excited about this whole project, and I'm very excited to bring up our honored guest, uh, Professor Donald E. Scott. In a previous life, Professor. At any rate, uh, that, uh, that discussion about the uh, the transistor action on the sun is what I talked about uh, last January. I, I don't know whether any of you NPA folks were there, but it was a very, very nice uh, conference we had back in January. Uh, today, uh, because I realize that there's going to be more NPA folks here, perhaps people who have not been um, uh, as, as uh, inundated with uh, the um, Oh, okay, I still have to go. Okay, there yeah. right, we go. Sorry about that. Just go ahead and take it off the stand. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, no, let me see if I can keep my mouth here. Uh, they, there are people who um, maybe are not as familiar with the E as some of the other people were at, uh, at uh, Las Vegas. I thought maybe um, what I might talk about today is a very basic question that people might have. Uh, okay, so you're talking about an electric universe. How does stuff form in an electric universe? We've all heard in the standard cosmology about the Big Bang. Uh, we've also heard um, off and on about accretion disks, uh, about gravitational collapse. How do we concentrate stuff? Well, the astronomers have it, have it easy because the only tool they have in their toolbox is gravity. And gravity concentrates stuff. Except when you really look into it, accretion disks don't accrete. You take a, a, a pancake-shaped hunk of sand and it's rotating and you say, well, okay, it, 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 it accretes, it, it, it loses diameter. And if, if that happens, well, you know, the, the ice skater who has her arms out and twirls, when she brings her arms in, what happens? She goes faster. So we are, the only way you can get an accretion disk the size of a galaxy to accrete down to the size of a star is to all of a sudden have something that rotates the speed of a dentist drill. And that doesn't work. So we think we have a much more plausible answer for how stuff accretes. How do you make stars? Uh, and the original title of this was Stars, Stellar, and Galaxies. And I, I submit it's really just a matter of scale. The mechanism that I'm about to talk about really is ubiquitous. It, it happens with stars, and it also happens with galaxies. And uh, obviously, <laughs> you, if you've ever heard about the electric universe, you've heard the word Birkeland current. And so clearly, Birkeland currents are involved. Birkeland currents are streams of moving charge that flow within galaxies and actually flow in intergalactic space. Uh, our contention is that stars form along those Birkeland currents. Um, people have, uh, through the ages, have said, gee, look up at the sky. You can see the strings of stars. And astronomers have said, no, 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 no. They don't form in strings. 
And uh, yes, they do, and they really do, because now astronomers realize that they form in strings. And the latest out of, uh, I forget where it was, um, some, some astronomy uh, uh, powerhouse said, uh, they form in strings, but the strings are made of dark matter. Well, we don't think they are. We think that the um, Birkeland currents undergo a magnetic pinch, squeeze, and that there's another mechanism, which I'll briefly mention, called Markland convection, which enables stuff to get together into a lump. And then you, gravity can take it from there. But um, the, um, the idea of an accretion disk is really not, not the way things happen. Critical to this is a thing called a double plasma focus device. Perhaps you've heard of a plasma focus device. Uh, Eric Lerner is using them to uh, try in uh, Lawrenceville, I think is his, his company, uh, trying to make uh, fusion. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, plasma focus devices, but a double one, which is something new. I didn't invent it, but I think most people haven't heard about it. Um, they should have, but they haven't. So let's talk a little bit about it. Anyway, these cosmic Birkeland currents go meandering through space. They're not straight, they're, they're crooked, they have joints, they have elbows, they, they meander. Uh, astronomers still, many of them don't agree that they exist, uh, but we know they exist because we, uh, as the radio telescopes are able to measure magnetic fields out there, and we know that the only way you get magnetic fields is from electric currents, and so here they are. They're not always visible, uh, in fact, most of the time they're not visible, but they're there. Um, we believe, they, as I say, stars and galaxies form on these filaments, and the question is how, and by, by a Markland convection, and the magnetic pinch, and the plasma focus. Here's a picture of a, a star forming on a Birkeland current. Uh, the the um, dynamics that I'm about to talk about in this picture have already occurred but this is what's left. And I think it's pretty obvious that there is some sort of a string there, and it's, at least apparently, not to, me, not to my eye, it's not dark, uh, dark matter. But anyway, astronomers now know that uh, stars do form in strings, and in April of uh, last year, <laughs> the ESA announced that uh, they discovered networks of tangled gaseous filaments, gaseous, oh, okay, plasma guys, <laughs> uh, in the clouds between the stars. Um, we can actually see stars forming like beads on strings in some of those filaments. I think the astronomical uh, community is, uh, must hire a bunch of people to go out and, and rip things out of libraries because there's so many books written that say, no, 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 stars don't form on strings. Yes, they do, they do. Uh, galaxies also form on strings. Uh, let me just read this, this release. Um, you can see there a pair of galaxies on, on a, uh, a semi-luminous um, Birkeland current. Um, this is uh, from The Economist of, of about two weeks ago. They said, the young universe was first filled with lattice of threads of dark matter. Then the visible stuff gathered around these threads and formed the galaxies familiar today. And uh, there's a fellow who looked at uh, two galaxy groups, Abel 222 and 223, and said that these, uh, he, he saw a connection, like you can see in this picture, and they're going to uh, see if they can find and prove the fact that uh, this is a visible dark matter, or anyway, it's not. It's a Birkeland current and it's plasma. Uh, here's a typical um, kind of event that I'm gonna talk about today. And this is the so-called, uh, an example of a so-called planetary nebula. Uh, there's nothing planetary about a planetary nebula. It's, it was, it's an antiquated terminology uh, that astronomers in the middle 1800s, they knew what nebula were like, you know, like the Orion Nebula and the nebula around the Pleiades. And then there were these other things, but they didn't know what they were. They weren't globular clusters of stars, so they just said, well, they look kind of like planets. Well, they don't really look like planets. And some of them have this hourglass shape. Um, I maintain, and many of us maintain, that that is because of a Z punch. <laughs> Perhaps you've seen that, that uh, crushed Pepsi can 
uh, it's well known that if you pass a high current through a hollow uh, conductor, that the current will form a magnetic field, right-hand rule, and that magnetic field will crush, will tend to collapse the, the conductor. And so that's what we think is happening here. Um, the mainstream comment about planetary nebula are the planetary nebula is like the glowing relic of a dying sun-like star. You're going to hear all this death and dying and collision and horrible stuff coming out of astronomers because they have this one, one tool. You know, to a guy with only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> so uh, everything is collapsing, colliding, dying, uh, etc. Uh, here's their explanation for that hourglass shape. It's a planetary nebula produced by the expansion of a fast stellar wind within a slowly expanding cloud, which is denser near its equator than its poles. Uh, no, I think it's more like three fairies got together and tied a rope around it. <laughs> There's as much uh, uh, logic or, or reason or evidence behind what they said as what I just said. So no, it's not a, a fast star cloud. It's a magnetic pinch. And it, uh, my, my question is, well, if it's uh, this fast stellar wind, where do the x-rays come from? It's obviously an explosive dynamic event. Uh, here is a, another typical one. Uh, that's, you can see the hourglass shape there. Um, NASA said, and they love this, um, this poetic the sands of time are running out for the central star of this hourglass-shaped planetary nebula. Really. Um, my comment is the star is not dying. It's being born. Winston Bostick was a, um, a fellow who worked at uh, Los Alamos back in the, well, it was important work there. It was in 1956. And what he took, did was he took two plasma focus guns, and we'll talk about them in a minute, and aimed them directly at each other, and boom, just like two dueling pistols. What he created in the middle of that was a focus, a plasma focus. And he uh, took high-speed motion pictures of that. And what he generated, and some of you who have seen Tony Peratt's um, uh, plasmoids, and that's what he generated. And it wasn't until about 20 years later that Tony, in, in the, also Los Alamos, was managed a computer simulation where he duplicated the results that Winston Bostick got in real life in the laboratory in 3D. Uh, Bostick made the cover of the New York Times in 1956. There's a, if you go back in the uh, library, you can see that he said, the scientist creates universe in lab. And uh, he, he did. So anyway, this is what a plasma focus device looks like. It's the guts of it. I have, I have my good friend, Walt Thorny, to thank for this slide. It's a beautiful slide, and I, I robbed a few of them from him. Um, but it's a, essentially a two uh, concentric um, metal conducting uh, tubes, if you will. You, um, you put a, a high voltage, if I can get this mouse to work okay about 14, 15,000 volts on that capacitor. You drop the switch closed, and you apply that voltage across between the inner brass in this model of electrode and the outer copper electrode. And what you get is this uh, form right here. Uh, if you look at this in the front end, uh, that, that first, that white thing, looks like it's an annulus. Uh, it has the same shape as an old 45 RPM record that is a circle with a big hole in the middle. The big hole is the inner brass electrode. Um, and and that, that annulus moves out in this, in this picture toward the right. And the, the contact point here runs along the brass electrode and then curves around and comes back in here. Sorry about that. Um, and, and the same thing, of course, happens on the bottom. And what eventually happens is it looks like, a, if you can picture an umbrella, and that's an umbrella shaped, so in other words, it's a continuous uh, plasma discharge out here, and where your hand would be 
um, putting up the umbrella is the focus. That's where stuff gets concentrated. It's just inside the, uh, the curvature of the umbrella. And uh, reading Bostick's paper, I found out this, this uh, what's his right and left business down here? Can I get rid of that? Or not? Well, it's not important, but uh, the beam forms, there's a beam that comes flying out of here. When the inner electrode is at a higher voltage rather than a lower voltage. Uh, this is one of the things, talking about experiments, uh, that, that I think should be done. Eric Lerner probably knows all about this, but I don't. And I think anybody who's, if we're going to have experimental backup for the EU, I think, for example, this is one possible place where we might do some, some study about how, to, how do you form this beam. I know that there was a, a time when uh, they thought they might weaponize this and make a Buck Rogers zap gun out of it. But it wasn't controllable enough, and also they found that uh, high-powered lasers are much more effective weapon weapons than these things are. But let's put it this way: you don't want to get your eye in the in the front of this thing. This is a stream of neutrons, and so there's a real killer beam here. Uh, but anyway, if, if you do things right, in other words, and I think it's because if you set that voltage higher than that voltage, you'll get this beam coming out this way. Um, here's um, the pictures of the of the actual a. Uh, this A thing here is, uh, is the, uh, the plasma surface is forming. You can see how uh, what happens is this comes out around here and it goes back in, and you see it here. Here's the, the densest part of the focus here, but then eventually that focus moves out just to below the shape of the umbrella, the parabolic umbrella. If you look uh, into the device, you see something that looks uh, like that. Um, also, uh, there are these things that we see in space, and uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Sykes had that picture on it. I think somebody had that picture on it. It was him. And uh, so it's very similar looking to the what we see in the laboratory from the plasma focus. Uh, here's a, a real picture of a pulsar, and if that isn't a plasma focus, I don't know what. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's the same thing that, uh, that our previous speaker did. I mean, uh, my comment, it, it looks like a plasma focus. Does that mean it is? No, but it might be. And uh, it, it looks more like a plasma focus device than it does an accretion disk or a collapsing, so whatever. Um, the, the comment from the mainstream, of course, is that's, that doesn't mean anything. Just because it looks like the yeah, same thing doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean so, uh, yeah, just, but if it quacks and walks and waddles and could be a duck. But uh, again, their comment, gravity can't repel anything, regardless of what we heard yesterday about what Newton thought, uh, possibly thought. Um, the jet's evidence of a black hole or maybe gravitational collapse. Well, I don't think it is, but that's the standard uh, discussion you get. There's a picture of Bostick's plasmoids. And there's what he did. He nailed these, these things together and shot them off. And uh, actually, I wish that uh, in this picture that uh, I had moved this gun on the right in closer to the left because there is really only one focus here. It looks as though there are two. And uh, what really happens is there is one focus, one, one concentration point, and the two umbrella-shaped plasmas actually intersect each other. They actually go into each other, like two big torpedoes that don't just come up and touch, but push into each other a little bit. And where they push in is a ring, is a circle. And so the locus of intersection of those two um, parabolic arcs uh, is, a, is a circle, a ring. And we can see that, and we will see that. Anyway, there is a, a real picture from the Hubble scope, and I suggest that that black and white one at the bottom it certainly looks very much like what Bostick did in the laboratory. So I'm suggesting to you that what Bostick did in the lab is exactly to mimic what goes, out in, what goes on in space. Um, also notice, uh, in, uh, in actually in both these pictures, but especially here's this one, there's a lump of stuff out here and another lump of stuff out here. I'm suggesting to you that what is happening is this plasma gun the one on the, on the right 
He is squirting a jet out toward the left, so that this jet out here is due to this discharge, and this discharge produces that jet, and they move in opposite directions. Um, uh, this, these, these appearance of these things out here are consistent with what Hannes Alfian said should happen. He claimed that these should be double layers. Uh, in discussion with Wall, uh, he points out now that astronomers call these things flyers. And I think Wall is going to talk about them in, in his talk in an hour, uh, half an hour, whenever I shut up here. Uh, but uh, whether they're flyers, flyers meaning fast moving, low ionization, um, what is it, Wall? Something or okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, su I submit they're, uh, they're double layers, and we can have a discussion uh, of, of the properties of double layers, which might lead them to think that there was a low ionization uh, region. But it evident it, evidently, I mean, this is indication. Is it proof? No, it's not proof, but it's an indication that Bostic had it right. That this is exactly what's going on out there. Uh, Markland convection. Markland, uh, his name is Gurren Markland. He's uh, alive and well. He's uh, working uh, in Stockholm right now on the properties of Birkeland currents. And he discovered two, I think, marvelous things about Birkeland currents. One, uh, they suck up, they, 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 they scrounge up um, matter from around them, and they work this, uh, the, the outer one here, uh, they work like a, a, a vacuum cleaner hose that has perforations in it. So if you lay a, a vacuum cleaner hose across your living room rug and it's got holes in it, the, the vacuum won't work as well as it does without the holes, but the dust will be sucked into the, into the, the, the hose. And uh, he also discovered that the the Birkeland current is really a set of, of uh, uh, axial um, cylinders, coaxial cylinders, and the matter, the material, the elements that form those concentric cylinders uh, arrange themselves according to the ionization potential of that stuff. So for example, the, the radius of the low ionization material, like uh, in this case iron, uh, silicon, Magnesium, uh, about eight volts. That those are that, that, that material forms close to the axis. Uh, carbon and sulfur, uh, sulfur uh, ionization voltage higher, so the radius is higher. Uh, you don't see helium here. Helium is is the highest uh, ionization uh, potential of any of these. And so it, there's another uh, another ring out here of helium, perhaps. Depends on what's in the area where, that the Birkeland current is passing through as to what's going what's to be made, what the Birkeland current plasma will consist of. Um, anyway, uh, that was his contribution. And um, these Birkeland currents uh, go and permeate, as I said before, galaxies and intergalactic space. And if you stop and think about it, Suppose you were, you've got to visualize, suppose you're looking at a galaxy, you're out there in a spaceship and there's a galaxy over there, and you look at it. This galaxy is permeated with these, these a nervous system of these Birkeland currents, every one of them sucking in matter. Okay, so everywhere you look in this galaxy, you're seeing Birkeland currents sucking matter away from you. It's true that on the other side of the Birkeland current, matter is being sucked toward you, but you can't see that because it's on the other side of the Birkeland current. So because of the, uh, the characteristic of these things, that they suck in matter, for an observer, it always looks like the matter is being sucked away from the observer. What does that suggest? Redshift. So this is an inherent sort of background uh, level uh, mechanism uh, that might well, what should I say? It would, it would form a, a, a sort of a, um, a minimum level redshift for any galaxy or any place that there is a Birkeland currents. Well, and anyway, there is uh, on the left is my uh, little picture of what a coaxial cable looks like. That's RG59U. Everybody knows what that looks like. If you were to put that in a vise and clamp down on it, 
uh, just think of squeezing this in a vise very, very tightly. You'll destroy the cable, of course, but what you will probably do is you will make conduct outer conductor B come in contact with inner conductor D and in the process destroy the insulation C. In other words, you, you can if you squeeze on this thing with a high enough compressive force, you'll create a short circuit. you short the two conductors together. And that is what I maintain is happening uh, when a magnetic pinch is applied to these things. There's, you, you can see in the inner um, yellow colored uh, conductor, uh, both carrying the currents in, in red, but the, uh, the squeezing of, the, of that B field um, squeezes the, uh, the short to happen. So all of a sudden, boom, you get this spark release. There is only one spark release. Uh, it's right there in the middle. And as we saw in the previous slide, uh, really, uh, that's, that, uh, that focus is inside both of these umbrellas. So this bluish umbrella really should be drawn a little bit around it to the, to the left. And this one should be drawn a little bit around it to the right. So that there are, if, if these two umbrella, these two parabolic shapes were where they are shown here, there'd be two different focuses. There isn't, there's only one focus. So consequently, the, the two parabolic shapes really, as I say, they intersect, they jam into each other and form a ring uh, boundary. Um, there is, again, thanks to Wall, I think the, the archetype, the, the prototype of this type of object you can see the concentric cylinders. Markland is right. You can see what I, or Alfian calls the double layers, or what, what astronomers have chosen to call flyers. There's a, there's a pair of them here and another pair of them out here. You can see the pinkish, the parabolic shape here, intersecting the parabolic shape there. And if we took a close enough look, you'd actually see the ring intersection of those two parabolic noses kissing each other, sort of like kissing fish or something. Um, there is what I suggest happens, um, and you end up with that. This is another, I think, excellent picture, and it shows the, uh, if you feel carefully, you can see the, uh, the, the doubleness, the, the, the duality of the, uh, the concentric cylinders. There's one here and one there. There's one here, there's one there. Uh, you can see the uh, this discharge squirts out a, a jet in that direction. It doesn't come out straight necessarily because the Birkeland current might be bending out there. And so they come out in a, in a curve. They follow the, the Birkeland current. Um, anyway, I have lots of pictures. Oh, I didn't know what to do with this one. I, this is a, a, a fantastic object. It's called Gomez's Hamburger. That's the legitimate name for this thing. And it's a, it, that's what it looks like. And I can't figure out whether you're seeing the two noses of these two torpedoes coming at each other from the upper right and the lower left, or whether there's a Birkeland current from the upper left to the lower right, and what you're seeing is the beginning of the pinch. I don't know. I don't think anybody does. Uh, astronomers will tell you it's all due to a fast solar wind or something like that. Here's another picture of these, and I think this is a very, um, uh, instructive picture. Uh, you can see all of the things that I've been talking about. You can see the, the double layers or the, the, the flyer out here and one out here, the jet this way and this way, the two parabolic kissing fish or whatever you want to call them. Here you can actually see very nicely the uh, this inner circle, uh, but it looks ragged, doesn't it? This makes a, a, a point. And that is, this is a dynamic event. And like any dynamic event, like an explosion, it goes bang and whoosh, and then dies out. So we all should realize that plasma is, some plasma is visible. There's glow mode plasma, there's dark plasma, but there's also dark mode plasma, called dusty dark mode plasma. You can't see it. And so I submit that what's happening here is the, the current density in the, in the parabolic shaped uh, kissing fish, if you will, uh, uh, are losing their, it's getting weaker and weaker. There are places 
where the places where it's visible, that the current density is high enough to make the thing in glow mode. But where it, it, it is not um, visible, that current density has died off so that the plasma, which is still there, we can't see because it's dropped into a dark mode operation. Um, there are any number of these, and I've got several. And there's, you can really see the overlap of the, uh, of the what you call the parabolas. Uh, you can also begin to see that slightly there's a, a, a flyer out here. And, uh, there's a bit of a ring that you can see. You can also see that the, the Birkeland currents are dual. You see them? There are two of them in there. It's a concentric uh, system. Here's the typical crab nebula, but we all know that it really looks like that. If you use your, your imagination, I guess, I can see it. You, you look at the blue only and see if you can erase the yellow and the red in your mind's eye. Can you see the ring? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you also begin to see, <laughs> excuse me, begin to see the jets uh, both ways and the ring in the middle. Um, here's another one. These are all different um, planetary nebulae. Um, there's another one. This is the cotton candy nebula. Uh, this one, you, and I don't know, this, this one you can certainly see the remains of the parabolic, the, the parabolic shape on the, on the left, I guess you'd say. Uh, you can see the sort of the vestigial remainder of the, the two jets leaving in opposite directions. And you certainly see what's left, the newborn. There's another one. This, this is kind of interesting too. Uh, you notice the ring here, um, if you think of it as that, that being the ring, that sort of purplish colored thing, uh, is not perpendicular to the axis. It's sort of over on, a, on an angle. Um, we'll come back to that in, a, in, in my last slide. There's another one. You can see the, the strength of it is not symmetric. Uh, there was more of a powerful release on one side of the pinch than on the other. Uh, here, oh, here's this. This is a classic uh, for any amateur imager like me. This is the Holy Grail. <laughs> this is uh, Thor's helmet. Uh, if you can uh, image this, you've got a good rig. Uh, it looks like you know the what, what Brunhilde in, in Botan. You know, I mean, it's the, the horned helmet. But knowing what you know now, you can really see that there is that parabolic shape, and down here. There's the vestigial remains of another one. And there's the ring in the middle. Oh, this is the Nicholas Nebula. That's all you've got left here is the, the ring. Everything else has died down. The current densities are, are low enough that the plasma stops radiating. There's a classic one, I think. I don't know where they get these things from. The rotten egg nebula. But anyway, again, you can see the duality, the dual nature of the, uh, of the Birkeland current itself. Uh, you can see the jets streaming out one way or the other. You can see the, the either double layers or flyers or whatever you want to call them there. And in this one in particular, you, you can see what's left in the center is uh, plasmoid, probably like plastics plasmoids. Uh, here's another one. Most people would not even see the parabolas there. Do you see them? They're, they're, they're the, the red areas. You can coming down around here. There's one that comes back out that way, and then there's another one that comes in here and goes out that way. And where they are kissing, you see the ring. And in the middle of that, uh, what's being created, or at least, again, we're not creating matter out of nothing. We're, we're concentrating matter by sucking it up from the surroundings of this, this event. Here is, again, I got this from Wall too, and I guess this is a very popular uh, slide now. This is uh, Hannes Alfian's stellar circuit. If you rotate this 90 degrees, uh, I suggest what you, you can see. This is the jet going out one way. This is the jet going out the other way. And coming down here and in here and then back out this way, that's your, that's your parabolic uh, arc. And coming up from the bottom and coming through here and coming back down that way, that's the other parabolic arc. And Alfian with his dotted lines said, I don't know how they connect, but they connect somehow, way out there someplace. 
So that path is not necessarily where where Elfian drew it. It could be coming out here and then way down and, and then. Uh, here's a, a, a recent discovery. Uh, we did, never thought that the star Formalo, Formalo, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, depends on whether you in the Greek or Latin. Uh, it's a very bright star in the southern, southern sky, and they've just discovered that it has a ring. And they're discovering more and more and more stars that have rings. Maybe all stars have rings. Maybe that those rings are not necessarily in glow mode. They're probably there, and I suspect that what is, is happening is around every star is that structure that I described to you, that hourglass shape, almost none of which is now in glow mode. So what you get is the star. But if you're lucky enough and you make close enough measurements, sensitive enough measurements, maybe sometimes you can see the ring. And this, I think, is within the last year or two that they discovered this ring around Fomalo. Um, is it part of a double plasma focus structure? I suspect, I, of course, I'm prejudiced. I think it is, but who knows? Here's another one. This is the uh, famous supernova, 1987. And you can see how rapidly it's changing. This is January 03, and this is April 05. So in two years, you can see that the ring has brightened substantially. There's more, more points on here, apparently, than there are in here. And I don't know whether it's my eye or not, but it looks to me as though this, these outer rings, which, of course, are within the parabolic structure, uh, I think they're, they're a little bit dimmer here two years later than they were here, but I don't know. Maybe that's just my eye. But obviously things are changing, and I would suspect uh, very seriously that what's going to happen in another 10, 20, 30 years is these outer rings will disappear, and the inner one will remain, and eventually that one will disappear too, and you'll be left with whatever you created in the middle. Uh, this is a classic uh, Radio Galaxy 3C31, and it doesn't exhibit much, much of what I'm talking about as far as the, the two parabolas and, and that shape, but it does show you that this galaxy, so-called, is formed on a, on a Birkeland current. And it does show a, a strong pinch. Excuse me, I don't want to go that far. Um, where am I here? There. This, this is the Centaurus A um, in, within our galaxy. And uh, you can see that uh, again, it's got that sort of ring sh structure and the, uh, the two jets with these lumps of stuff in the jets, whether they're double layers or what, we don't know. Um, these um, two different things here, this upper diagram is slightly moving, can you see it? Um, the, the center of this is not here, which is where I thought it was when I looked at a still photograph of this, but the center is over in here someplace. And this whole um, picture here is moving outward toward the right. But it's clearly, your, here's your double layer or your flyer or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a new type of uh, Herbig Harrow uh, object now called MHOs. Those are the molecular hydrogen objects. They're just the same as, as Herbig Harrow objects, and they behave the same way. And I submit that what you're looking at here is the, this is the center of the thing. There's probably a ring around here that we can't see. And here is the jets with their lumps of stuff in the, in the jets. Uh, from the, to the right of MHO 188, the stuff is moving to the right. And to the left of 188, the stuff is moving to the left. Uh, this is my last example. Uh, this is called the garden sprinkler. Um, people are like, like, just just to show you what, if you look this up on the web, what you'll see is astronomers are puzzled by the bizarre jets emerging from planetary nebula, uh, sprinkler nebula. However, the S-shaped jet from this object is the most perplexing of all. Jets are long outflows of fast-moving gas, plasma, found near many objects in the universe, such as around young stars, or coming from black holes, neutron stars, and other objects. No, it's a, it's a standard sort of birth of whatever is in the center of this. You can actually see 
the ring. See it around here? And this one seems to be a little stronger, this parabolic um, entity, but there is the other, the other half of it. There's one of these flyers out here and a flyer out there. So anyway, this is really my last slide other than just a summary. Uh, that, this is not a, a, a real image. This is a typical artist's conception of what our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, would look like if we could get outside of it and look back in its plane. So the Milky Way galaxy is lying in this plane. <coughs> the artist even has just in, drawn in some dust lanes, <laughs> which I, we all know are there. So there's the, this is the Milky Way. And what this stuff is on the outside, well, let me read you the, uh, the press release from this. This is from Ibex. Um, that uh, this artist's conception shows an edge-on view of the Milky Way galaxy, newly discovered gamma ray jets in pink. You can see them there. Extend for 27,000 light years above and below the galactic plane and are tilted at an angle of 15 degrees. Remember that other one was tilted at an angle of about 15 degrees. Why is that? Why does that happen? Nobody knows. But here's a, another case where the the um, the axis, which I presume the the, the two jets are here, it, and the whole thing is the, the, our our galaxy is tilted at an angle of about 15 degrees from that axis. Um, previously known gamma ray bubbles are shown in purple. Okay, so there it is. Um, I would suggest too that. Um, because of the IBEX mission, um, remember they discovered a, uh, a ribbon that circled around, I think Wall referred to it earlier, somebody was talking about it. Uh, I suspect that that's the remnant of the ring that formed around the sun when the sun was created in an event just like this. Anyway, is this universal? Do all stars form this way? Do all galaxies form this way? Um, do they all have vestigial rings? I think it probably is true. And it may not be true, but I think it's, you should keep in mind when you look at some of these objects that what you might, might be looking at is a whole model like that, that M26, that, that uh, archetypal um, hourglass planetary nebula or whether it's just a some place like a star where that whole structure is still there but it's it's now in dark mode and so you can't see it and of course astronomers would laugh and say wow he's, that's a cop out well okay i don't think it is but maybe it is i think it may well be the case but anyway stay tuned more news thanks very much there's there's a good that's the best picture i've seen in the we have uh, time for questions. Please come up and go ahead, Paul. Yeah, Don, how fast do those dense plasma focus, at least in the lab, those fronts move? 